Nikki Pulling, part one. It all began on the day of spring fling, when everyone was getting together to have fun. The children laughed and the birds did sing. The petty blue cars blinged and shined. And this terrible poem tried to rhyme. <laughs> Amber and Joy had a good time scary, spooky minds, time after time. We are all the prettiest flowers in the garden of youth. At the end of the day, you only have to be better than the person you were yesterday. Because yesterday was the lime of our keystone rhyme. <laughs> to move forward from the foregone days gone by. To never look back. And moving forward to the person we want to become. We must eliminate the horrors to which society has become numb and create a better world for the children to come. Community Poem, Part 2. <laughs> it all began on the day of spring fling. RCC students stormed through the pathway of fun, enjoying activities and food under the bright sun. All of these wonderful things just makes me want to run. There's no question this whole thing is impressive. The guy dressed as Batman is also impressive. <laughs> Actually, the whole thing was impressive, poem, fling, and all. Phi Beta Lambda was a shining star of the spring fling. Life should be beautiful, like when a bird begins to sing. Just because someone stumbles and loses their way doesn't mean they're lost forever, Charles Xavier. Yoga too meditated while enjoying the spring fling. Don't be afraid to sing about all the good things. If you can dream it, you can do it, Walt Disney. <laughs> With a little effort, you'll get through, says me. Blammo. <laughs> and this one is called the Day the Saucers Came by Neil Gaiman. <clears throat> that day, the saucers landed, hundreds of them, golden, silent, coming down from the sky like great snowflakes, and the people of Earth stood and stared as they descended, waiting, dry-mouthed to find what waited inside for us, and none of us knowing if, it would, if we would be here tomorrow. But you didn't notice this, because that day, the day the saucers came, by some coincidence was the day the graves gave up their dead and the zombies pushed up through soft earth or erupted, shambling and dull-eyed, unstoppable, came towards us, the living, and we screamed and ran. But you did not notice this because on the saucer day, which was the zombie day, it was Ragnarok also, and the television screens showed us a ship built of dead men's nails a serpent, a wolf, all bigger than the mind could hold. And the cameraman could not get far enough away. And then the gods came out. But you did not see them coming because on the saucer zombie battling gods day, the floodgates broke. And each of us was engulfed by genies and sprites, offering us wishes and wonders and eternities and charm and cleverness and true brave hearts and pots of gold while giants fee fo fummed across the land and killer bees. But you did not know of any of this because that day, the saucer day, the zombie day, the Ragnarok and fairies day, the day the great winds came and snows and the cities turned to crystal, the day all plants died, plastics dissolved, the day the computers turned, the screens telling us we would obey. The day angels, drunk and muddled, stumbled from the bars, and all the bells of London were sounded. The day the animals spoke to us in Assyrian, the Yeti day, the fluttering capes, and arrival of the time machine day. You didn't notice any of this because you were sitting in your room, not doing anything, not even reading, not really. Just looking at your telephone, wondering if I was going to call. This poem is definitely not as fun as that one was. Um, this is one I wrote myself, and the first four lines of it are where I kind of got my inspiration from. So if you've heard of it before, you're like, oh, that's what okay. All right. 
Got my daddy's tongue and temper. Sometimes my mouth could use a filter. God shook his, de his head the day he built her. Oh, but I bet he smiled. The same smile reflected on her birthday from her loving parents who God gifted with her. For only he, she knows deep down inside how truly blessed she was with her daddy's tongue and temper. Got my daddy's tongue and temper so I can relay without a whimper. My kin call it a blaze when I open my mouth like brimstone eating, fire breathing dragons. I set fire to my path, a clearing trays blazer, trays, trailblazer. That one always gets me messed up. With my daddy's tongue and temper. We've always heard the phrase, you can do anything you put your mind to. But without wind beneath our wings and fire drips from our breaths, the path becomes relentless. And we can pray, we can sweat, we can bleed, and we can curse. But nothing can be accomplished without someone's tongue and temper. Um, the poem is, that I'm going to read is something that I wrote many years ago. It's called My Friend the Wolf. And it's because I've been diagnosed with something called systemic lupus, which is called the wolf. Um, when I was diagnosed, the doctors told me three things. Number one, we've never seen blood work like yours in the living person. Number two, we had narrowed it down to two illnesses and one of them you'd be dead within two weeks. And number three, you have lupus. I was terrified. But this is something that there's no cure for, so I had to finally accept it. I had started a lupus support group and there were some people who were really depressed and so I wrote this point for them. Someone read it a while ago and she reminded me that this actually works for anybody. We all have the wolves in our lives that come. We never know when they're gonna arrive and a lot of times they're gonna stay and we just have to accept it. One day the wolf came knocking, banging loudly on my door. Somehow in that moment I knew my life had changed forevermore. I didn't want to answer. I yelled, please go away. But the wolf just kept on knocking and he said he was there to stay. I realized I had to face him and I couldn't run and hide. So I opened up the door and ushered him inside. He said we had a lot to discuss and he wanted me to be his friend. He explained we had to accept that we'd be together till the end. We talked and talked for hours that night and he held me while I cried. I told him I just couldn't accept it no matter how hard I tried. He said he didn't want to hurt me, but it was a choice he couldn't make. He just hoped someday I could understand so the hurt would be easier to take. I grew to realize he was right and we became friends that day. I told him I forgave him and that I knew he had to stay. All friendships have their ups and downs. Ours is no exception as anyone can see. But we'll work it out the rest of our lives, just the wolf in me. I will be reading a poem I wrote called Mistakes, and I'd like to dedicate it to anyone who's going through a hard time. In the beginning, it was the best. It has been so long since I felt like this before to the point it keeps me from rest. I love you more than you know, but now that I know the truth, I must let you go. No matter how we feel about it, we can't do anything to change the facts. We've got to stop before the second act, before we go too far and can't go back. It's time to go black, cut off communication. There's no time for deliberation. I'm going to hell for sure. Not even the Holy Scripture can save me from this fate. I promise I won't make a fatal mistake. No matter how much I try to fight, you send me to new heights. I can't fight my demons anymore. I can't deny them, that's for sure. It's only a matter of time till I lose control. If it comes to that, I will set myself on fire like the souls in the pit, like the coals in the pits of hell is my soul. To be damned for the rest of time till my to relive my sins till the blood falls from my eyes. I am damned to hell when this vessel dies. I'm done, I'm finished, and I'm spent. This doesn't even make any sense. My heart is broken, I can't take it anymore. All the things you tell me cut me like a knife, that's for sure. I can't do this, I can't take it, I'm done. Now it's time for me to run. I wash my hands of you because there ain't nothing I can do. If I've said it a hundred times, if I've said it once, I've said it a hundred times, you and I will never be anything after this rhyme. Now it's time for me to say goodbye, I'm done. I can't do this, not now, not ever. Yeah, you think you're clever, trying to manipulate me into your evil scheme. I will not be part of your twisted dream. I'm not going to be your scapegoat, for all I know what you're telling me is just a hoax. You screwed with me for the last time. Don't worry, I'm not gonna drop a dime. I'm done with you and all you put me through. It's time for me to start anew, this time without you. I'm done. I can't do it. 
No, I won't do it. No matter how much you beg and plead, you will never have me. I don't know how to say what's on my mind. I'm done with you and all mankind. No, not this time. I will not be confined. I will put my feelings into this rhyme. Because I know my time's not through until my dreams come true. I've got too much stuff to do. Here on earth, I know my worth. I was put here for a reason, and it's not going to be for just one season. It's time to put the past away. It's time to start a new day. This one better than the last, as long as we don't live in the past. We'll keep it simple. This is a um, poem by an American poet named W.S. Merwin, entitled The New Song. For some time I thought there was time, and that there would always be time, for what I had a mind to do, and what I could imagine going back to and finding it, as I had found it the first time. But by this time I do not know what I thought when I thought that good. There is no time, yet it grows less. There is a sound of rain at night, arriving unknown in the leaves, once without, before or after. Then I hear the thrush waking at daybreak, singing the new song. I wrote this last semester when I was in American Lit. Laying across the plush brown sofa, the noises of the night creep through the ecru painted cinder blocks. The continual humming of the refrigerator attempts to drown out the approaching ocean. The waves crashing against the compact sand are dragged across the hard silicone before being released back to the sea. Jellyfish lost their battle against Neptune. Strown across a sandy battlefront, they lay silent. Gelatinous, transparent soldiers nestled down in foreign watery trenches. Underneath, their dormant stingers and pink tendrils hold their formidable appearance. Thunder clouds hang overhead, spreading across an endless ocean. Freezing surrounding air, walking across a desolate landscape. Sandpipers, the only companions, the condominium safeguarding a sole individual. Turning before his trek back to safety, he looks out past the ocean. Sand blowing, swirling across brine packed brethren, dancing and snaking toward the water. The wind pushes the loosened swirls. They march against an unseen force on another continent the Mahobi cousin dreams of this salty oasis. Driving home, the sky compresses. The colors of the day, blues and pinks and purples, twist the clouds, forming wings, arms, and a dragon's head. Breathing in the last of the sun's heat, spreading out the dying cubes evaporate like coals. This is my attempt at poetry in another language. I'll try my best. I believe in you. I don't believe myself, so. <laughs> <laughs> you can't understand it, just feel what I'm saying. <laughs> she knows. <laughs> Hasta la frontera del espacio. Desde los límites terrenales. Que no sienta sola. Cuando viene la tormenta, cuando se seca la tierra, cuando anochece y cuando aparece el sol, bañando la tierra con sus rayos de fuego, estaré contigo. Pasando la, pasando la luna, alrededor las estrellas, me quedo firme. No importa dónde estés y no importa a dónde vayas, y cuando late la del corazón, sepas que estoy contigo. Between what I see and what I say. Between what I say and what I keep silent. Between what I keep silent and what I dream. Between what I dream and what I forget. Poetry. It slips between yes and no. Says, says what I keep silent. Keep silent. silent. What I say. Dreams. What I forget. It, it is, is not speech. speech. It is an act. It is an act of speech. Poetry, Poetry. speaks and listens. It, it is real. And as soon as I say, it is real, it vanishes. Is it then more real? Tangible, tangible idea, idea, intangible word. Poetry finds and goes between, between what is and what is not. It weaves and unweaves reflections. Poetry scatters eyes on a page. Scatters words on our eyes. Eyes speak. Words look. Looks think. To, to hear thoughts. See what we say. Touch the body of an idea. Eyes closed, the works open. Thank you. Um, this 
What I'm going to read is actually a class assignment that Ms. Tahari assigned Yes, I love her. Um, and we had to choose a line from three different poems that we had discussed in class and tried to read. I won't say very well on my part. Um, one of those poems was 20 Songs of Love and Song of Despair, written by Pablo Neruda. And then another one was uh, Between What I See and What I Say, written by Octavio Paz, and then Hope, written by Emily Dickinson. And so what we had to do was uh, write a poem and incorporate a line from each of these into our own poem, which was very challenging me, for me because I'm not poetic. And so we had to dedicate it to someone, and I chose to dedicate it to my late husband. And I'm gonna read it in Spanish, yay. So the title of it is Amor Hera Siempre. It's dedicated to my late husband. La esperanza es la cosa con fumas que posa en el alma. Yo te busco en mis sueños donde estás. Tengo que creer que vamos a estar juntos. Están corto el amor y es tan largo el olvido. Mi vida cambia cambio para siempre. Y yo sigo aquí en este mundo. Tien, tienes mi corazón para siempre. Estoy triste y perdida sin ti. Entre lo que digo y callo. Tú eres mi amor para siempre. Bravo. Um, I'm going to be reading a poem by William Wadsworth um, called We Are Seven. A simple child that lightly draws its breath and feels its life in every limb. What should it know of death? I met a little cottage girl. She was eight years old, she said. Her hair was thick with many a curl that clustered round her head. She had a rustic woodland air, and she was wildly clad. Her eyes were fair and very fair. Her beauty made me glad. Sisters and brothers, little maid, how many may you be? How many? Seven in all, said she, and wondering looked at me. And where are they? I pray you tell. She answered, seven are we, and two of us at Kanye dwell, and two are gone to sea. Two of us in the churchyard lie, my sister and my brother, and in the churchyard cottage I dwell near them with my mother. You say that two at Kanye dwell, and two are gone to sea. Yet ye are seven, I pray you tell, sweet maid, how may this be? Then did the little maid reply, seven boys and girls are we, Two of us in the churchyard lie beneath the churchyard tree. You run about, my little maid, your limbs they are alive. If two are in the churchyard laid, then ye are only five. Their graves are green, they may be seen, the little maid replied. Twelve steps or more from my mother's door, and they are by my side. My stockings there I often knit, my kerchief there I hem, and there upon the ground I sit and sing a song to them. And often after sunset, sir, when it is light and fair, I take my little porringer and eat my supper there. The first that dies was Sister Jane, in bed she moaning lay, till God released her of her pain, and then she went away. So in the churchyard she was laid, and when the grass was dry, together, to get, together round her grave we played, my brother John and I. And when the ground was white with snow, and I could run and slide, my brother John was forced to go, and he lays by her side. How many are you then, said I, if two are in heaven? Quick was the little maid's reply, O oh, master, we are seven. But they are dead, those two are dead, their spirits are in heaven. T'was throwing words away, the little maid, uh, t'was throwing words away, for still, the little maid would have her will, and said, nay, we are seven. Hey, everyone. Hello. We decided to read um, just a third of this book. <laughs> Maybe not. Uh, not just one poem. It's called I Am 25 by Greg Corso. With a love of madness for Shelley, Chatterton, Rimbaud, and the needy yap of my youth has gone from ear to ear, I hate old poet men, especially old poet men who retract, who consult other old poet men, who speak with uh, their youth whispers, saying, I did those then, but that was then, that was then. Oh, I would quiet old men, say to them, I am your friend, 
what you once were through me, you'll be again. Then at night, in, their in the confidence of their homes, rip out their apology tongues, and steal their poems. I wrote this in uh, probably my favorite English teacher so far in school, and that would be uh, Professor McCormick right here in front of me. And what he did, he uh, made these nice little books uh, for our class, and they're variations on William Carlos Williams' uh, poem, um, which is uh, called The uh, Red, Red Wheelbarrow. Um, and also, this is just to say. And this is my variation of this is just to say. I have cut the flowers that were in the garden for which you never meant. Colors the house, no apology. They are decorative, not drab, and very pleasing. This is my first foray into any sort of poetry other than English 111. And I thought uh, cliches would be a great, great place to start. So here they are. A rose by another name would smell as sweet. The last the rose fell from its tree. All on deck, abandoned ship, as ye shall sow, shall ye get. Better life for a better night, better light a candle than curse the night. Bet it all, bet the knife, bets are off for the lonely wife. Coin a phrase or get cold feet, caros seldom find their sleep. Call in one, call in all, Carlos robbed the wife she falls. Dastard fiend, do spite the deed, done for now to end the means. Do it once, do the Dutch, dear wife is gone, no more crutch. Once upon a time, a stutter disgusted me. You muttered distrust at me. A pity I had to fly. I've only ever taken what's mine, so what if I helped you? I've been myself too, and twice. I've had the wind knocked out of me. Why just to curl up and die? No, I've had too much pride, so I'll breathe it in, let it all slow. When I turn to go, find you trailing behind. I've fought for every last inch that I've got. I must forgive me for leaving my spot. Not standing in wait while you finish the race with those two broken legs you've got. One thing's for sure. If I were you, I never would have let it stop me. I never have before, and if you knew what I've been through while trying to get through to you, you'd thank me. You'd get down on a knee, you'd let your pride be hurt, you'd say that you were sorry, but I would say it first. Once we used to be eye for an eye, now I've given up trying. Oh, how could I be so blind? You'll never let me settle the score. To you, I'm a scourge, not some partner in crime. I've fought for every last one of you schmucks. I might as well have saved my luck, not wasted it all on some short-sighted know-it-all, so-called friends you're not. But one thing's for sure. If I were you, I never would have let it stop me. I never have before. And if you knew what I've been through while trying to get through to you, you'd thank me. You'd find me in a dream, on some uncharted map, and I would say I'm sorry, and you would take me back. It was many, many a year ago in a kingdom by the sea that a maiden there lived whom you may know by the name Annabel Lee. And this maiden she lived with no other thought than to love and be loved by me. She was a child, and I was a child in this kingdom by the sea. But we loved with a love that was far more than love, I and my Annabel Lee. With a love that winged seraphs of heaven coveted her and me. And this was the reason that long ago in this kingdom by the sea, a wind blew out a cloud of, by night, chilling my Annabelle Lee. So that her high-born kinsman came and bore her away from me to shut her in the sepulcher of this kingdom by the sea. The angels, not half so happy in heaven, went envying her and me. Yes, that was the reason, as all men know, in this kingdom by the sea. Then the wind came out of a cloud, chilling and killing my Annabelle Lee. But our love, it was stronger by far than the love of those who were older than we, of many far wiser than we. And neither the angels in heaven above nor the demons down under the sea can ever dissever my soul from the soul of the beautiful Annabelle Lee. For the moon never beams with, without bringing me dreams of the beautiful Annabelle Lee. And the stars never rise, but I see the bright eyes of the beautiful Annabelle Lee. And so, all the night tide, I lay down by the side of my darling, my darling, my love and my bride in her sepulchre there by the sea, in her tomb by the side of the sea. Um, there's a poem called Invictus that a lot of people, when they read it, they don't even understand it. It was written by my great, great, great uncle, proud to say, William Ernest Henley. Um, sort of a side note, he was best friends with Robert Louis Stevenson, 
and he's actually the inspiration for Long John Silver. William Ernest Henley lost his leg when he was a child um, due to complications from TB. He wrote this poem having to do with living and not giving up. And this particular poem was passed around um, with uh, POWs in North Vietnamese prisons. However, they could write it, toilet paper, whatever, they would pass, especially the last stanza, back and forth to give each other hope not to give up. So this is Invictus. Out of the night that covers me, black as the pit from pole to pole, I thank whatever gods may be for my unconquerable soul. In the fell clutch of circumstance, I have not winced nor cried aloud. Under the bludgeonings of chance, my head is bloody but unbowed. Beyond this place of wrath and tears looms but the horror of the shade, and yet the menace of the years finds and shall find me unafraid. It matters not how straight the gate, how charged with punishments the scroll. I am the master of my fate. I am the captain of my soul. <laughs> All right, so I haven't really explored my poetry side, but thanks to Mr. McCormack, I definitely found a poem that I really, really liked, and it's called The Road Out Taken by Robert Frost. Yes. So two roads diverge in a yellow wood, and sorry I cannot travel both. And be one traveler long I stood, and looked down, went as far as I could, to where it bent in the undergrowth, then took the other just as just as fair, and having perhaps the better claim, because it was grassy and wanted wear. Though as, though as for me, that the passing there had warned them really about the same, and both that morning equally lay in leaves that stuck that trot in black. Oh, I kept the first for another day, yet knowing how way leads on to way, I doubt if I doubted if I should ugh, I doubted if I should ever come back, I shall be telling this with a sight. For ages and ages hence, two roads diverged into a wood, and I I took the one less traveled by, and that and that here or that has made all the difference. Um, <clears throat> this is a poem that means a lot, a lot, a lot to me. <clears throat> so, when I was a wee lass and came here back in 2013, I actually had no interest whatsoever in poetry. I thought it was kind of lame. I, it just didn't connect with me whatsoever. So, I really need to dedicate this to Mr. Ryan Knight, who read earlier. He is the one who showed me this poem, and it was actually from this poem that I was like, oh wait, poetry can actually be cool. So this is dedicated to him and for all the wonderful things he's done for the school. And this poem is called Lady Lazarus by Sylvia Plath. And I hope I can do this some justice. It's a very strange one. <clears throat> I have done it again. One year in every 10, I manage it. A sort of walking miracle, my skin, bright as a Nazi lampshade. My right foot, a paperweight. My face of featureless, fine Jew linen. Peel off the napkin. Oh, my enemy, do I terrify? The nose, the eye pits, the full set of teeth. The sour breath will vanish in a day. Soon, soon the flesh, the grave cave eight will be at home on me, and I a smiling woman. I am only 30, and like the cat, I have nine times to die. This is number three. What a trash to annihilate each decade. What a million filaments the peanut crunching crowd shoves in to see them unwrap me hand and foot, the big strip tease. Ladies, gentlemen, these are my hands, my knees. I may be skin and bone. Nevertheless, I am the same identical woman. The first time it happened, I was 10. It was an accident. The second time I meant to last it out and not come back at all. I rocked shut as a seashell. They had to call and call and pick the worms off me like sticky pearls. Dying is an art, like everything else. I do it exceptionally well. I do it so it feels like hell. 
I do it so it feels real. I guess you could say I have a call. It's easy enough to do it in a cell. It's easy enough to do it and stay put. It's the theatrical comeback in a broad day to the same place, the same face, the same brute, amused shout. A miracle that knocks me out. There is a charge for, eyeing of, for the eyeing of my scars. There is a charge for the hearing of my heart. It really goes. And there is a charge, a very large charge, for a word or a touch or a bit of blood or a piece of my hair or my clothes. So, so, Herr Doctor. So, Herr Enemy. I am your opus. I am your valuable, the pure gold baby that melts in a shriek. I turn and I burn. Do not think I underestimate your great concern. Ash, ash, you poke and stir. Flesh, bone, there is nothing there. A cake of soap, a wedding ring, a golden filling. Herr God, Herr Lucifer, beware, beware. Out of the ash I rise with my red hair, and I eat men like air. I was actually sitting back there trying to find one that I wanted to read, and I decided on Oh Captain, My Captain by Walt Whitman. Yes. yes. Oh Captain, My Captain, our fearful trip is done. The ship has weathered every rack, the prize we sought is won. The port is near, the bells I hear, the people all exulting. While fellow eyes and steady keel, the vessel grim and daring. But oh heart, 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 oh the bleeding drops of red. Where on the deck my captain lies, fallen cold and dead. O oh, captain, my captain, rise up and hear the bells. Rise up for you, the flag is flung. For you, the bugle shrills. For your bouquets and ribbon wreaths, for you, the shores are crowding. For you, they call the swaying mass, their eager faces turning. O oh, captain, dear father, this arm beneath your head, it is some dream that on this deck you've fallen cold and dead. My captain does not answer, his lips are pale and still. My father does not feel my arm, he has no pulse, no will. The ship is anchored safe and sound, its voyage closed and done. From fearful trip, the victor ship comes in with object one. Exult, O shores, and ring, O bells, but I with mournful tread walk the deck my captain lies, fallen, cold, and dead. Looking through old maps, snow globes of the cities I have visited, long ago in a distant time, a hand reaches back into my memories. I remember country hopping during my time overseas, Thanksgiving in Switzerland, Christmas in London, Christmas in Rome, Christmas in Kuala Lumpur, Christmas in Singapore, Christmas in Hong Kong, Christmas in the Holy Lands, New Year's in Cairo, American presidents' birthdays in Berlin when it was divided into West and East, American President's birthdays in Japan, fond memories that stay with me as time propels past the decades.